Today we're going to be talking about some of the best picks when adding a single allied knight to your army. Hello and welcome back to Wars Pets Tactics, the strategy focus 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. So I know quite a lot of people with Imperial Armies have been tempted at some points to try and ally in an Imperial Knight to make their army stronger, to try and cover a weakness, or just add a really big cool new model to their army. With a small boost to the Knight's power with Engine War, the Imperial Knights will be getting a little bit more attention than they usually would be. So in this video we're going to talk about some of my favourite builds for allying an Imperial Knight into an otherwise non-Knight Imperium list. So there's positives and negatives to allying in a single Knight to an Imperium army. The main negatives being that if you just include one knight in a super heavy auxiliary detachment, you don't get a household tradition or a quest or oath from the new engine war book. The household trait is basically like chapter tactics, the knight ones are okay, they're not enormously strong for the most part, but they are a solid power boost, as is the quest or oath, the quest or imperialis ones get plus one to their advance and charge, and the quest or mechanicus ones get to heal one wound for free per turn. So naturally the downside is that you lose out on those ones, but on the positive side, a lot of the strength of Imperial Knights are from their Warlord traits, Relics and Stratagems, and by just including one Knight in your list you're not diluting these at all, you can just use the absolute strongest for your purposes, so even though the single Knights don't get the advantage of the household trait, just because it's taking the absolute best stuff, means that just for the individual model you're taking, it might be as strong or more strong than other Knights that do have the traits but don't have access to those Relics, due to another Knight already having taken them. We'll mainly be looking at the Imperial Knights and the Codex today, the Forge World ones are okay, though at the moment I think that the Codex ones are the strongest, at least until Games Workshop rebalances the Forge World rules. I'd say in my opinion, the single best take all comers knight is the Crusader at the moment, and it has been for some time. I think there's also something to be said for an single knight gallant, and now Engine War has come out, it's added a few useful stratagems for the other Questorus variants, so compared with previously, they're far more worth consideration. In general, I think the Dominus classes aren't quite as strong point for point. The Castellan was one of the strongest things in the game for quite a long time, of course, but it got a heavy points and survivability nerf at the same time, so it's just a little bit expensive for what it does. And the Valiant has good damage dealing, but has to get very close to the enemy with all the negatives that that brings in terms of counterattacks. They're certainly fun to play, but they're not necessarily as strong as the other variants, in my opinion. We'll take a look at each of these in turn in a second. It's important to note that you still get to nominate your knights as being from a household, even if you don't actually get the trait, and it can be quite important because each household gets access to its own unique relics, warlord traits and stratagems, so the choice of household is still quite an important one, even if you're not using the trait. In general the free blade qualities and burdens just aren't really very worth it in the imperial knights, the chaos version is far stronger. As it stands I personally not bother with these at all I'm afraid. One of the best things about having a solo knight is that they have access to relics and warlord traits from their own stratagem and you'll just be playing one command point for a relic and for a warlord trait. I wouldn't generally make an allied knight your actual warlord as they'll just be a target that your opponent can directly shoot, plus it means you have to lock in these abilities, you'll have to select a warlord trait and nominate their relic if you nominate them to be your actual warlord. Whereas if you're not the Warlord, and you just get to buy these in with one command point each, then you can use the stratagems to basically tailor to your opponent's army list. This is a really powerful thing with Imperial Knights. Say for example, if you were fighting an enemy with a ton of low AP weapons, you could think about giving the Knight a 2 plus armor save just to foil them. Or if your entire opponent's army is high AP close combat weapons, then you could give your Knight a 5 plus invul save from the Sanctuary Relic. Being able to chop and change these is really quite powerful, and in general you shouldn't just be taking the exact same relics and war gear every single matchup, as sometimes those boosts just won't be relevant. Even the excellent Ion Bulwark Warlord trait for a 4 plus invul save won't be useful if your opponent's army doesn't have any meaningful shooting. Finally, I know we're mainly talking about just using one knight in this video, but I would strongly consider investing with another two Armager Warglaives or Armager Helverins, as basically that could allow your knight to fill out a full super heavy detachment, it means your big knight will get the trait and oath, plus also a 3 command point benefit for filling out an actual detachment. So even if you didn't particularly want the Armagers, then they do provide a lot of benefit just by being there, even if they don't achieve an absolute ton in game on their own. Let's start with talking about the Knight Crusader then. This guy's my favourite at the moment, just because he has a really decent amount of firepower, and he brings it to bear on really quite a mobile chassis, so you can outrange and then jump into range on your opponent's army. And even compared with the other Questorus, he doesn't really lose all that much strength in close combat, due to being able to fight with the Titanic feet. My personal favourite go-to loadout for him will be the Thermal Cannon, the Avenger Gatling Cannon, and an Ironstorm Missile Pod for a bit of out-of-line-of-sight shooting. 
I believe that this one will cost you 468 points under the current rules at time of recording. I really like Crusaders for their flexibility, you can hang them back and just have them shoot with all their guns for several turns if the opponent's rushing towards you with melee and then counter charge, or if your opponent's a gun line and they're sitting back, then there's no reason at all that you can't just go stomping him straight up the board and trying to get in combat while also blazing away with all those guns. In general, I'd be most tempted to take a Mechanicus household for the Night Crusader, just for that excellent Machine Spirit Resurgence stratagem, which means that if they do put him down to like one or two wounds left, you can still have a turn of moving and shooting on absolute full capacity, which is an absolute no-brainer of a command point when you have so many guns firing at the enemy. For a single allied knight, my favourites are Krast and Tyrannis. Krast has access to the excellent Headsman's Mark relic, this is the one get that gives you plus one damage to any big enemy vehicles and plus two damage to any titanics. So this can be an excellent relic to buy in if you're fighting a mainly mechanised army, as it'll just mean he's so much more dangerous. They also have a warlord trait with reroll ones to hit, which can be very useful. Tyrannis, on the other hand, might be a reasonable choice if you've got a lot of command points to invest in him. There, in their darkest hour stratagem, means that he can have a chance of getting straight back up after he dies. It does cost three command points, and it's not guaranteed. He might need another command reroll, and even then fail it. But just for the sheer amount of pain that an Imperial Knight can cause in an extra turn of full effectiveness shooting, could certainly help swing an entire game. In addition, they have a relic thermal cannon, which again can be a pretty reasonable buy-in against a heavy armor list. In terms of warlord traits, I'd be typically wanting to run with a four plus invul save from Ion Bulwark. Though if you do happen to be against a list without too much high AP shooting, you could maybe take the Crast trait of First Knight, or even just amp up his close combat attacks with Knight Seneschal if you're really not worried about shooting. In terms of relics, my default pick would be Endless Fury, the Avenger Gatling cannon that gets extra hits on sixes, and also an additional two shots. It's really quite a big jump compared with the standard model. You get around about 11 or 12 hits compared with the average 8 of the standard Avenger. It's a really good relic. If you are fighting a ton of low AP anti-tank weapons though, then a 2 plus save from the armour of Saint Dion can be reasonable. And we already mentioned Crast's Headsman's Mark and Tyrannus' Relic Thermal Cannon. Engine War gave a pretty helpful new stratagem to these guys. Now if your Crusader causes damage to any enemy unit, for one command point you can make that unit not overwatch this turn. This one could actually be really useful with an allied knight, say if you've got a squishy close combat unit that's going to tear the enemy apart but can't get through an overwatch. Having the Crusader at least take off some damage off that unit means that you could get that unit in for absolutely no trouble. It is a really handy stratagem to have on an allied knight. If we move on to another one of my personal favourites, which is the Knight Gallant, I do feel that this guy's a little bit underrated, and is often dismissed by people saying you can just screen him out. Even against people who have said that, I don't think I've had a single game wherever on a Knight Gallant where he hasn't either been shot first anyway, or caused a very solid amount of damage in the enemy lines. I do think that Gallants are a little bit underestimated, even since they went up in points. Personally though, I wouldn't give him any other upgrades besides what he already has. I wouldn't take the Iron Storm Missile Pod or anything, just as that way you can then just focus purely on getting him into close combat. In terms of households, I'd either pick one of the Mechanicus ones that we talked about before, or maybe think about House Terran from the Imperialist side, as that one has access to a 3 command point stratagem to allow a Knight Gallant to fight again. With the sheer amount of damage that these guys can do, then it could be 3 command points very well spent indeed. In terms of Warlord traits, there's quite a lot more choice with the Gallant, and you should definitely apply them reactively to the enemy again. Land Strider is an absolutely excellent one for the Gallant, plus 2 to advance and charge genuinely will mean more charges, and it combines beautifully with the full tilt stratagem, meaning that your Gallant has a crazy threat range, around about 26 or 27 inches on average, before you've even thought about using command rerolls or things. People definitely do underestimate just how far this guy can charge on average. Otherwise, 4 plus Imbor saves from Ion Bulwark are also great, and if you don't feel like you need the extra movement or the Imbor save, say you're playing a slow moving melee horde coming towards you, then Knight Seneschal can be a decent one, just to amp up his close combat a bit by giving him yet more attacks. In terms of relics, again he can be very well tailored versus an enemy army. Generally, if you're fighting knights, I'd certainly think about the Paragon Gauntlet, a damage 8 Thunderstrike Gauntlet. With no negative to hit, generally means that he will be wrecking an Imperial Knight or Chaos Knight in one round of combat, plus it means that he can be very efficient with the use of the Death Grip stratagem. Otherwise, I'd typically think about using a defensive buff for him, just so if the enemy does feel the need to shoot him down, then they're going to have to pay for it with more firepower. A 2 plus save from the Armour of Sainted Ion can be pretty reasonable, particularly if he's thinking about trying to wade through hordes of enemies, or potentially if your opponent has lots of very high AP weapons, then Sanctuary can be great. It means that you can also rotate Iron Shields in close combat, giving him a 4 plus invul save there. I found that Sanctuary is often a relic that I realise I should have taken in hindsight. 
In general, the Gallant's a really good distraction card effects. Some games he might not do anything, but in general, the opponent will feel the need to kill him anyway. And as knights go, he's very cheap, meaning that you've likely wasted a whole ton of enemy firepower for a relatively low points investment. If he does get the opportunity to use Death Grip on enemy characters, and that can be a very quick way to finish them off. But my absolute favourite thing with Knight Gallants is trying to make them auto explode. Basically, run one with Land Strider, try and get a first turn charge, then the enemy will have a Knight Gallant in their face, which they will want to kill. And when he goes down, you can just shower everyone with mortal wounds, provided you can roll that 4 plus. There's nothing like the satisfaction of killing multiple Smash Captains in one explosion shortly after they've taken the Gallant apart. In terms of other Questorus Knights, in general I would have said that these weren't quite as strong prior to Engine Wars updates, but every single one of them has got a new lease of life with new stratagems. In general, I'd be most tempted to run them with their gun arm, a Reaper Chainsword, and an Iron Storm Missile Pod, just some cheap Ignores Line of Sight shooting. Again, I'd most typically be wanting to run them as a Mechanicus household for Machine Spirit Resurgent, though you can certainly think about running them as a household with a specific relic, such as House Terran for the Thunder of Voltaurus Battle Cannon, which is both Strength 9 and has additional shots. The Preceptors... The Knight Preceptor is a far more interesting option than he used to be, he has dropped a ton of points, and now in the new book he has one of the best of the stratagems, where his 18 inch anti-tank shot automatically gets 6 shots, pretty much making him a flatly better Knight Errant when you use it at this range. He also has the advantage of giving reroll ones to your Warglaives as he leads them about. The Paladins become a lot more interesting as well, that rapid fire battle cannon now has a stratagem that can make it damage 3 for a turn, which I believe is likely going to be best when you are applying it to Thunder of Voltaurus, the Terran Relic one. That thing will reliably be pumping out something like 6 or 9 wounds each turn versus enemy armour at very long range, never mind the knight's combat prowess as well. The knight errant is also pretty cheap and now has a stratagem for re-rolling wound rolls with its thermal cannon, and the warden has the advantage of being able to take endless fury, which is arguably one of the best relic knight weapons, and means that it can still be a very solid shooting platform while not paying for the second gun of the knight crusader. Retaining a Reaper Chainsword if you do want to be engaging heavies, and now it's got a stratagem to allow you to auto-hit with that Avenger Gatling Cannon when it's less than 8 inches away. I think it'll be remaining to be seen whether these guys start to edge out the Crusader at all. They're certainly a ton more viable following Engine War than they were before. In terms of the two Dominus Pattern Knights, the Valiant and Castellan, at the moment I do think that they're a little bit weaker than the other options, but if I were to run them, I'd certainly consider using the Valiant as House Hawk Shroud, Hawk Shroud has a stratagem to allow it to overwatch for nearby friendly Imperial troops, and when you're doing that with that enormous conflagration cannon, you really are going to be toasting some heretics. Questor Imperialis also have access to Traitor's Pyre, which is the relic version of this, and it allows you to re-roll wound rolls with the weapon. That's basically an auto-include on a Knight Valiant if you're running one. In addition, it has its own overwatch stratagem now, where it means that you suffer a minus 2 to charge penalty if you try and charge it and it successfully fires overwatch. And there's also another interesting stratagem for when it deals damage with its harpoons, it might be able to shock enemy units with d3 mortal wounds all around it. I'm not sure if all of these quite let the Valiant catch up, I think it would certainly be stronger in a list where you have multiple pressing threats, so there's more chance the Valiant stays alive to do its thing. The main issue for me is that you have to play very aggressive with it, and it's a very high points cost model, it's going to be a very big deal if the opponent manages to shoot it down. In terms of the Castellan, I'd play either Raven, Crast, or Tyrannis with it, and be prepared to invest a lot of command points if you are buying such a big and expensive knight. It's still just as lethal to enemy vehicles as it was, but obviously at a much higher points cost. Raven's excellent for that famous reroll one stratagem, which does cost more command points now, but it's absolutely worth it on a Castellan. All those add up so much, and it just means that you get about an extra 50% damage or more out of the Castellan each turn. Crast again is great for the Headsman's Mark and reroll one's Warlord traits, and Tyrannus I'd only think about if I was wanting to get him back up after he died, which could at least give you a very good chance of getting several turns firepower out of him, even if your opponent does try and focus him. I'd almost always take the 4 plus invul save warlord trait on this guy, unless the opponent really does have like literally no ranged anti-tank whatsoever, you just really don't want to be rotating ion shields on them when it costs 3 command points rather than 1. In terms of relics, typically Cause Wrath is pretty much an auto-include on most of these builds, that relic plasma cannon is just so much more dangerous than the standard version, but if you are playing Crast, you could think about the Headsman's Mark for extra damage on all of his weapons if you're fighting against vehicles. Finally, I thought I'd just mention support armages, which still kind of stick with the theme of one big knight, but obviously let you fill out that super heavy detachment for the Household Tradition, Allegiance, Oath, and three command points. If we are getting a Household Tradition, then again I am a big fan of Tyrannus and Crast, just as before. 
This explosive heal no pain type save from Tyrannus is a great just flat defensive boost, useful against literally anything besides mortal wounds, and Crash really helps amp up the close combat abilities, particularly of the Questorus pattern knights that aren't gallants interestingly. Of course there's all sorts of other options, including tons of custom household traditions in the new engine war book, but then we're sort of getting onto knights tactics in general. In terms of which support armages that you could think about taking, Warglaives are very cheap, you can get them at under 150 points now, and while they're not the most dangerous thing in 40k at the moment, they are pressing threats that your opponent pretty much will have to deal with, and they will do reasonable damage to whatever they make contact with, whether it's a vehicle or an infantry squad. With their fast movement and thermal spears, they can certainly help add to the number of threats that your opponent has to deal with. Helverins will just provide you a little bit of extra backfield fire support. For me, you pretty much get what you pay for with them. They're not outstanding damage output, but they're not bad and will do damage to pretty much everything. They're only truly efficient against things with three wounds, such as Space Marine Aggressors or Harlequin Star Weavers, or Toughness 5 or 6 vehicles, things like Eldar Flyers, for example. Finally, you could think about Armager Moiraxes from Forge World. They can certainly add a fair bit of anti horde potential if you equip them with Lightning Locks. They're just pretty cheap, effective fire support that's pretty decent against most targets, though particularly so against infantry. For around about a points cost of an extra 300 points or so, they're a very reasonable potential include if you are thinking about taking one Titanic Knight anyway. I don't think that they're absolutely mandatory, seeing as they will have an opportunity cost for 300 points spent elsewhere in your army and your main strategy, but I would certainly think about them. Finally, I would just bear in mind the other opportunity costs of allying knights in. You might lose combat doctrine, some space marines, or grey knights times of the warp, or the sisters of battle additional abilities that they get from running as a pure list. These certainly do disincentivize you a little bit to taking knights, although some armies they can do much better with, particularly things like Astra Militarum, which are absolutely fine to ally with them, or particularly with Adeptus Mechanicus, who actually have additional synergies, such as being able to repair them, or maybe using Knights of the Cog to gain extra damage outputs or defensiveness out of their Canticles of the Omnissire. If you can think of any other considerations or ideas when using an allied knight in an army, please let me know down in the comments below. It will certainly be interesting to hear your thoughts. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with Imperial Knights in 9th edition, when everything gets turned on its head a bit, and lots of points changes happen. If you enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics. We have regular 40k tactics content on Imperial Knights and plenty of other armies. If you have been enjoying all the content I've been making recently, then any support on the channel's Patreon page will be greatly appreciated, as the Patreon page is what allows me to keep on spending all this time making Warhammer 40k tactics videos. As well as keeping the new videos coming, channel patrons have a fair few other advantages, such as being able to see certain videos early, voting on what sort of videos come next for the channel, and regular monthly prize draws where I post out miniatures to lucky winners. If any of that sounds good, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description below. And of course a massive thank you to my current patrons for allowing this channel to happen. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.